All righty, I believe we are live. We were having a little bit of technical difficulties. If you all are with us, if you don't mind letting us know in the chat that you're with us. Let us know in the chat where you're from and that you are with us. All righty. Hello, everyone. I am Fakisha Gunn, Associate Dean for Students at Memphis Theological Seminary, and welcome to our Doctor of Ministry information session. If you're joining us on Facebook, please invite people by tagging them in the comment section. I would also like to encourage you to share our video on your page. You never know who may find this video helpful to make a decision about their theological education. Now, although we have 10 tracks within our doctoral program, tonight we will focus on our new track, which is our general track. Here with me is our Associate Dean of Doctoral Studies, the Dr. Christy Woodbury Moore. Dr. Christy Woodbury Moore, will you tell us a little bit about your background? Ma'am, <laughs> yes, I can do that. I'll try to be as professional as possible. Um, I am Christy Woodbury Moore. Um, I am from Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, I went to Tuskegee University where I received a Bachelor of Science degree in chemical engineering. Then I moved to Minnesota uh, where I worked as a manufacturing engineer, uh, received my MBA while I was there in strategic management. Um, and then my call to ministry accosted me and moved me to Richmond, Virginia, where um, I was a full-time student at the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology. I received my MDiv and my DMIN. Um, I am currently um, the Associate Dean for Doctoral Studies at Memphis Theological Seminary and a first lady and a wife and a mother and all of these uh, things. Did I leave out something? I might have. Uh-oh, you're, you're muted. Good. My apologies. Thank you for uh, your bio. I always love to to hear how uh, diverse your background is. But uh, share with us about the introduction of this new um, demon track called the general track. Okay. So um, what's interesting is that I love the general track, uh, partly because when I started my own demon journey, um, I started out in a specific cohort. And um, as God was dealing with me and I was discerning what my work was and discerning this work my soul must have, as we talked about last week, um, the work that I needed to do wasn't within that particular cohort. But I was thankful that the school I was at um, had a general cohort that I could be a part of. And so um, I recognize that when students come to uh, the DMAN program, while they may have a project in mind and they also have a context in mind, they're human beings still trying to become and still are discerning what God is calling them to. And oftentimes, while they do an awesome job in writing this up in their application, um, there are times when they get into the process and they are in residency one they are still trying to discern and they're feeling stuck because they don't feel like they can move to another cohort. And so um, the general cohort is really uh, designed for people who not necessarily aren't interested in a specific track, but would rather stay more general um, in terms of how they um, complete their coursework. Uh, but it's also for people who are still trying to discern um, what specific track they want to be a part of. And so, um, I like it because it is, it's broad and um, you can still get the same scholarship, um, the same rigor that you would get within a specific cohort. And so um, I thought it would be helpful. Also, um, there are so many of our students who are interested in, in a specific cohort, but there's a wait list. But what would it look like if they could start within that general cohort so they don't have to wait? They're interested in MTS. Their spirit is moved by the mission and the work of the school. So why would, why would I want them to wait? No, no need to wait. Why don't you come on and start within the general cohort? You can still take the same classes that you would have taken in a specific cohort. You'll still get the same information. You'll still have to write a project document and all of that. And so I felt 
as it was something that was, I want to say relevant in the times because um, while specific is good, um, I don't want to leave out the student who is still discerning, but know that this is a yes. They just don't know what track um, they want to be a part of. Super. So walk us through the process of for a student who gets into the general track and they find that they have identified a track that they want to go into. At what point should they make the shift or do they stay in the general track? How does that work? So I think, so it all depends. So if a student is starts out in the general track, um, determines that they're interested in community witness and social justice, for example, and say that particular cohort has not started, then they would still read the books that are associated with that cohort. And um, in the event that cohort lines up with where that student is in terms of residencies, then it's fine for them to be inserted right into that residency um, with the other students in that cohort. Now, uh, what if community witness and social justice is not a cohort that's going to be started anytime soon? So what does that student do? Well, they stick with the general cohort. They continue to um, read the books that the social justice cohort would be reading, and they continue to work on their projects, and we make sure they connect with the scholars and the mentors that those who are in the, the social justice cohort um, have been teaching in. So they don't miss out. They don't lose anything. Um, yes, they may not be a part of that specific community at the time, but they don't miss out on the scholarship. They still can get the same scholarship, um, regardless of where they are in the program. Because the other thing I don't want to do is have a student start out in general in the general core and then they have to keep waiting, waiting around until residency six or waiting around. No, you can continue in this process and still get the scholarship you need um, along the way. Wonderful. For those of you all that are just now joining us, um, our uh, demon tracks normally run every two years. So what would happen is that every other year, is when we will introduce uh, the uh, about three new about three tracks that will have a two year rotation. In the midst of that, in the admissions department, what we found was that there were people who would apply during the off year, and they would wind up either having to wait a whole year or a whole two years. So, Dr. Chris, Christy Woodbury Moore's response to that is the general track and how important this is uh, for those who want to get started. They don't want the delay and they know what track they want to be in, but th there, there was a, a wait list or a waiting period. So this takes care of that. So thank you so much uh, for this, uh, for your uh, vision and uh, innovativeness with the uh, demon track that's general. Um, I, I, have, I have heard of, um, uh, what do you think is the difference between this general track and the, um, and the uh, having the other specific tracks? What's the benefit of having the general? Um, I think the, num the, the number one benefit is the student does not have to wait, one. Um, because as students are discerning, they can go to any school they want to go to. There is There are DMIN programs with cohorts all the time. And for a student who is discerning and um, is really, uh, the MTS is resonating with them, I would not want them um, to have this momentum and it's cut short because we do not have something that they need and they know this is the space they want to be in. And so number one, it allows them to start whenever they feel it it resonate with them. So that's that's the first thing. The other piece I think that I like and, and, and I love it about the general cohort is that it is not as specific. And I know you're like, well, why? I don't understand. What, does, don't you want it to be specific? Sometimes, sometimes I think specificity is necessary. If if you are trying to dig more into womanist and this is your specific area, then so be it. That's fine. Use the womanist cohort. However, there are some demand projects that are not necessarily um, better off or on if they're in a specific cohort. Um, all demand projects can fall within the general, every single one of them, because you still get the same outcome, a literature review, theological, biblical foundations, an immersion experience, you'll still get the same outcomes. So, um, and I think the other thing that I think is interesting, and this is what has been my experience in the specific cohorts, yes, you meet people that are within your uh, cohort that have common interests and common thinking. 
But in a general cohort, you meet people that are doing work that are that's vastly different than yours, but at the same time can still add value to your work. There is mm -hmm. something to be said about being in a space where people are doing projects that are vastly different than yours, but they're still trying to transform communities. So there is some, some meaning there that can be had in terms of what students might gain from one another um, that are doing projects that are that are different from one another. Um, and so I had I felt that in my own experience. I mean, I was in a general cohort and one of my colleagues was doing work around uh, religious freedom, which was different than the work that I was doing. And someone else was doing work around pastoral effectiveness, all of which um, informed my work. And then my work also informed their work. So it all really, really does work together. Oh, that sounds so good. Um, there was a question uh, that came up while you were talking. Uh, for some that may want to, uh, that that where they do want to uh, do something specific, but it's not within any of the other nine. Okay. Then they would go into the general track option, right? Absolutely. Mm hmm. Absolutely. So, and on the flip side, those who desire to do maybe not just one or two, but possibly three tracks, and they're not oh. sure which one to go into. The general <laughs> track <laughs> may yeah, also- Yeah, the general track could help. So the other thing about, I think the general track is that you say your project touches on several cohort tracks. Your project yeah. touches womanist, social justice, and preaching is leadership. It, it can fit yeah. in any one of these buckets. And you haven't really figured out which one is the, is the yeah. most- direct bucket for, for you is the right fit. So you come into the general tra uh, general track and maybe it helps you to refine your project in such a way where you can clearly see where it may fit. And at mm -hmm. the same time, what if it doesn't? What if your project still fits within all three buckets and you stay in the general cohort? Why not? You don't lose anything either way. Um, you don't lose at all. That's the good thing about the general track. Like it doesn't... Um, you don't lose an experience. You don't lose scholarship because you're a part of the general cohort. You just simply have decided that the work that I'm doing fits more within this general framework than a specific area. And I'm okay with that. Mm. I, I love, I love this. This, this is, is really, really good. Um, for those uh, leaders who may want to do a doctoral program, but they're not necessarily sure what specific track they want to go into, then definitely they can mm -hmm. come into the general track. Mm -hmm. And so the general track kind of takes care of that time that you know that God has called you to go into the demon program, but not necessarily sure what lane yeah. to go into. So that's really Absolutely. good. Dr. Andre and I still, ask, I still have access with those scholars. So say, mm -hmm. you know, oh, but I still want to study with I don't know, uh, Dr. Kenyatta Gilbert. I still want to study with Dr. Andre Johnson. I still want to study with Dr. Courtney Bugs. Well, I haven't lost their phone numbers and, and email addresses. So why not? Why can't you still get support from them even as you are matriculating through the general cohort? Uh, they still have books that are resources for you. They still can be accessible to you. No, they're not your cohort mentor, but that that being the cohort mentor doesn't mean that you don't get them as a resource in another way. So um, you don't, I mean, you really don't lose. Um, as a matter of fact, to be quite honest with you, when DMAN programs began, they began with a general <laughs> track. <laughs> there, we didn't get specific about tracks until recently as we began to understand the signs of the times. We pay attention to the pulse of what's happening in theological education, but also the pulse of what's happening in society and trying to bridge the gap between what does the minister need and what does the academy have for them? Mm -hmm. And so how do we make sure the minister and those who are in, on, in the, on the ground and in the trenches get what they need from the academy? But initially, when we first said, oh, let's do a D-Man program, it was all general. Everything was general. And you, as the student, was specific in what you were wanting to study based on your particular cohort, your particular context that you find yourself in. 
Oh, that's so good. I do want to go back to what you stated uh, not too long ago. How do students who are in the general track get connected to people like um, uh, Kenyatta Gilbert or Dr. Andre Johnson when they're going through and they're kind of identifying what their subject matter is going to be? How, how, how are they chosen or how do they get access to those folks? So um, one of the things that uh, they would do, of course, is if they are in the general cohort, and they are in residency one and they're working through their problem statement, their research question, that kind of thing. And uh, they're pr trying to get resources uh, uh, about something. So maybe this, this resource they want has to do with preaching. Mm -hmm. Then it really is as simple as saying, okay, who has MTS had in the past to teach in our preaching cohort or to serve as a mentor for a preaching cohort, because we have a list of those. Okay, now let's reach out to them and see, and see if we can get some help um, to help you in this particular area. It'll probably take maybe, what, 30, 45 minutes. Hey, Dr. Gilbert, I'm working on my DMN project. I know that you were serving as an instructor two years ago. Do you mind doing a Zoom with me for 30 minutes, just kind of talking through what I want to do? It's that simple. And I know that sounds... I, I know I might be overly simplifying it, but what I know about the people that we have asked to serve in this program is that they are invested in the student and the work that they are doing in the world. And mm. so many professors, no matter how famous they are, they are willing to help students do the necessary work to transform their communities. Why? Because they realize that we cannot do this by ourselves. We need some more people on the ground that's gonna help us move the mountain. And so many of these professors are accessible and available um, to help whenever we need their help. And so, and it also helps that MTS already has a relationship with them. So we already have a relationship. So you already know the program, you know the types of students we have. You don't even know the types of questions that they may ask. You have a syllabus, why? Because you just taught a class. So you can easily say, okay, here's my syllabus. Here, here are some of the resources that I provided to the students that were in the class at the time, take a look at this, this might be helpful to you. So, you know, we, we have a bank of folks who have already done this with some students that can really offer some wisdom um, and advice and suggestions as they are trying to refine um, their project. Super, thank you uh, for explaining that. My next question um, will be about the courses that are offered for each of the uh, residencies. Uh, do you need me to pull that up for you or can you I sure can okay oh okay here we go oh yes my favorite all right, so the first res is residency one, historical foundations and present realities. Here in this residency, this is where you dig into your literature review. When we come into a DMAN program, we come in with an idea of a problem, a problem that we want to solve, something we want to investigate, something we want to learn more about. And so this is where you would learn more about um, this problem that you're trying to solve. So maybe you're trying to, to bridge the gap between um, I don't know, uh, literacy, literacy for young children in third grade, right? Because we know that there's a prison, there's a school to prison pipeline if you do not know how to read by the third grade. We know this. And, and so say you're trying to do work around that. Then this residency one helps you to think about the research. It helps you to think about the, the problem statement. Um, it helps you to think about um, historical foundations. How did we get to the point where there was a there is a prison a school to prison pipeline for third graders. How did we even get here? So now here you get to dig into how the problem even became a problem. Um, you get to dig into um, who's burdened by this problem, but also who benefits from the problem, right? So that's residency one. That The outcome there is a literature review, um, a refined problem statement and your research question. Um, residency two is constructing our theological and biblical futures. So every project in the DMIN project has a theological and biblical foundation, meaning everything we do, we theologize. So what are we saying in our theologizing when we are talking about D 
the school to prison pipeline for our young young kids, right? And so here in residency two, you are laying out or or at the very least trying to outline your theological and biblical foundation. Um, in residency three, here is where you are really trying to dig into your your context. You're trying to understand yourself in light of your context. Why is that important? Because who you are in your context can either make or break at times the work that you want to do within that context. Much of the success we have is tied to the influence we have. Mm. And so if we have a strained relationship with the people in our context, they may not want to do a survey with us, <laughs> right? But if we have a good relationship with them, they may very well not only want to do a survey, but a focus group, interviews, or anything else you might ask them to do because of the relationship. So it's really trying to get into who are you, who is in your context, and how does this project fits into who you are and who they are at the same time. Residency four is exactly what it says. It's an immersion experience. It's um, thinking through either a conference to attend like the Proctor Conference or other uh, avenues to attend to in terms of um, immersion. So we have an opportunity here to really do something and curate something that is creative and different because again, these people who are in this cohort it's a broad cohort. And so there is an opportunity to not only do an immersion experience away from the campus, but also consider doing immersion experience within this, the limits, the city limits of Memphis, and really touching on some of the churches and community um, advocates, advocates and community organizations in the city of Memphis. Residency five is my favorite residency. And this is from research to resource. So often, so often, so often, we think that the D-Men degree is the end. Once you get it, you do nothing else. But my goal as the associate dean is to help students understand this is the beginning of the next. This is not the end of education, nor is it the end of the work that God has called you to. But it really is you taking the work that God has called you to to the next level. So what does it look like to turn your research into a resource? What's the point of doing research? if the people in the communities cannot grab it off the shelf and say, hey, let me use that with my youth. Let me use that with the adults in my community. And so here we are trying to help students think about, or at the very least envision, what does it look like to write a book, to write a curriculum about your work? So the goal here is to really get some folks who have already completed their DMIN, who have written a book, for example, Dr. Yvette Blair, who has, who has a demand, who can come back and talk about how she turned her, her dissertation for demand into a resource. The other piece is what would it look like to bring someone in to help you learn about grant writing? You might need a grant to help you think through your next as, as it relates to your project. So we want people to come in to tell you, here are some grant databases. Here are some ways we can turn your research into the next thing that can help your community. The other piece to that is social enterprise. There are some of us who are working in corporate America, but have a vision for, for to be their own boss and their research project in the D-Men can help them do that. So what does it look like to have someone to come in who has done work in their D-Men and now they have a business based on the work that they did in their D-Men project? So that is what we're trying to do, turn your research into a real resource that the community can use that conferences will buy. They want your book, they want your curriculum so that we can use that um, in, their in their churches, in their organizations and things of that sort. So um, I love Residency Five. That's one of my favorites because um, so often students are not thinking about a book. Um, they're so busy trying to get this work done that Asking them to write a book after <laughs> after they've sat and written so many papers, they are not interested in hearing anything I have to say. However, um, many of the powerful works that we get on the shelves is because someone has done some work in a DMIN, a practical project, a practical degree, and somebody has done that work and wants to share that with others in the community. Yeah. I saw so, Sharon. I don't know. Does that does I that mean, sound good? That sounds excellent. 
Because when I encounter people who have completed their demon project, that's it. They've done it. They're called doctor. And you very rarely hear that there's any work that happens afterwards. And so to see that we actually have a residency that's dedicated to helping students transition from it not just being a research um, a, a research uh, project, but turning it into a resource mm -hmm. for the marketplace or for the community or for your church is to me next level. Mm -hmm. And you brought up uh, Dr. Wyvet uh, Blair. Um, she's actually on the um, uh, our Facebook. She commented, if you all do not know about the Dr. Wyvet Blair, you need to get connected to her. She was a, um, uh, she graduated from our Deep Men uh, track of land, food, and faith. And she has been out here doing the work and sharing and replicating and making disciples um, in regards to uh, food insecurity. Um, I was in Atlanta, she's out of Dallas, but I was in Atlanta and ran into her at a conference and she was one of the presenters. And I was excited to have uh, be able to sit in on a snippet of what she was talking about. And so the work is, um, I think she graduated maybe a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. but still doing the work and has become a very strong uh, theologian and uh, social activist in the field. And so um, I think this work is definitely empowering. It also helps students to be able to center their thoughts because they're working through ideas and visions and um, and just the details of what God has given them. And I think you're on to something, Dr. Uh, Woodbury Moore, with this next step of um from research to resource i think that's 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 next level and that that you all that are on here <laughs> please make sure that you get connected to memphis theological seminary in our doctoral program um because this right here what we're offering in our doctoral program is definitely next level this is something that you can't sit on this is not only tools to be able to research but to also offer it as a resource. And I, I haven't seen that in other places. Dr. Blair is actually such a, a good example of that because not only did she turn her, her project into a resource, but she's also come back to the school to be an advisor for students. She's come back to the school to teach a course. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, she's actually getting ready to lead um, the immersion experience for Land, Food and Faith, that cohort this coming summer. Um, but what's what I think is most important is that she found her passion and continues to do work within that passion. And I think um, that's the other goal in terms of the demand. I, I don't want students to just come to be called doctor. I really mm -hmm. want them to discern, Lord, what is my passion? What is what is the work my soul must have? And to come into this program ready to do the work that the work that is needed for your soul, right? Um, but knowing that because you're doing this work, the fire continues to burn so that when you are out of this program, the fire doesn't die. Why? Because we spark something in you to start. We are stirring up that gift that that's in the Bible. Right. And so when they're out of the program, it's something that they can't rest unless they continue to do this work. And I think Dr. Blair is certainly an example of of that, but also the ways in which God opens doors as you're continuing to do this work. That there mm -hmm. are people who are hungry for your voice. They need mm -hmm. to hear from you. And so you have to think, what is it, Lord? That What is my purpose? What are you calling me to do so that you can do that? Now, I'll say this, and I want everybody on the, on the Facebook, <laughs> on the Facebook to listen. Sometimes we don't really want to do that work because it causes us to remember certain things and it causes us to dig into spaces that we have decided not to um, deal with just yet. It's real, but what would it, I had, when I was at Proctor Conference many, many years ago, a young lady said, said to a group of us, she said, you come into this world with the medicine that your community needs. You come with it, you have it already. Now, if you could just figure out what your medicine is and begin to give that to your community because they need your medicine, you come with the medicine. And so what if our discerning, it's not just to discern to save souls in the sense of coming down the aisle, but what if our discerning is to save souls in terms of figuring out what my medicine is so I can give that to the community and that you give your medicine. We all give the medicine that God is in 
have given to us, to the community, so that our work is healing work, no matter what it is. Why? Because we are given the medicine that God has deposited in us. And so my hope, my joy, my desire, my, my hope is that when students come into the program, they're in a space that they are ready to discern the medicine so that they can begin to do this work so that they can begin to heal communities. That is my hope. So last week, the uh, takeaway nugget was we need to do the work that our soul must have. This week, I would like to present to you, you all the new nugget which is you already come in the world with medicine. What is your medicine to give to the community? That's powerful. That is powerful. Uh, Dr. Wyvet Blair uh, made a statement. She said that Memphis Theological Seminary provided me with the educational training platform and resources to be a food justice strategist. I've been doing a lot since graduating in 2022. Wow. And yeah. that is awesome. A food justice strategist. Mm -hmm. You, I'm, uh, I am elated to uh, be partnering with the doctoral program for us as admissions to be able to go out and share about all the great, awesome things that's happening at Memphis Theological Seminary. I don't see any questions in the comments, but Dr. Chrissy Woodbury Moore, do you have any final thoughts before I go into the admissions process? I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to see your application. We'll see you July 8th through 12th during <laughs> residency. So get the application in. I can't wait. I have my shirt on that says you are enough. There's nothing more you need to do than to apply and watch the Lord work. That's what you need to do. Watch the Lord work and apply and we will get, get going on the medicine you have to transform communities. Awesome. Well, you know what? We should get shirts made. <laughs> we should get shirts. <laughs> I think that would be great. So I'm going to go over the admissions process really quick. Um, our admissions process is pretty um, simple, very straightforward. Um, we use uh, the uh, the tech. We use our technology um, on our website. You can go to become a student, and then you can go to admissions requirements, and you can click apply. Uh, we have what is considered a student portal <laughs> and uh, the student portal will take you to a um, a place that's reserved, that's only, uh, you're only allowed to get into if you have an account. Um, you'll be able to go in there and uh, go through all of the items that are needed in order to be admitted into our program or at least to be considered. You'll complete an application. And on top of that, you'll also be able to, um, <clears throat> you'll also be able to, uh, uh, actually, let me pull this up. I want you all to be able to see it. So you'll go to become a student degree programs. You'll go all the way down to doctor of ministry. I'm going to go to the uh, general track. Um, if you, uh, after viewing this uh, webinar, if you still desire to contact a recruiter, you can click this button and it'll take you to a schedule where you can schedule a, an in-person or virtual meeting. You can click on any of these buttons at the point where it says learn more and it'll take you to what we call a program guide. The program guide kind of walks you through an area view of the demon track that you have clicked on. For tonight, we're gonna to do the general track. Normally, our deadline for the Doctor of Ministry program is gonna be April 30th, but Dr. Christy Woodbury Moore has been so gracious to extend it to May 27th, 2024, as well as offering to be able to uh, waive the application fee. So you don't have to worry about that. Now let's go through admissions requirements. Let me make this a bit bigger. All righty. So sometimes when people are looking at the doctoral program and they're, they see the master's degree, they're thinking an MDiv, MTS, or a uh, master of arts degree. However, I want to present to you that you can enter the program with, a, with any master's degree program. What will happen is that depending on the track, we will send your transcript to Dr. Christy Woodbury Moore. She'll do an assessment and she will give a list of courses that you'll need called leveling courses. Those leveling courses will help to be able to undergird you in the track that you've chosen. It'll give you some theological courses and some courses that you're gonna need in order to be successful in that particular track. 
And so um, you can still, regardless of your master's degree, still be admitted into the program. Uh, we're looking for a minimum 3.0, but if you don't have a 3.0, we suggest that you still complete the application and allow for Dr. Chrissy Woodbury Moore and the admissions team to be able to do a full view of your application in order to make a, a determination. So don't let the 3.0 stop you. Um, of course, you'll need to go online to complete the DMIN application, which is very simple. It's just uh, general information about you. All of, we'll need all of your transcripts. That's your undergrad and your graduate school transcripts. Within the student portal or the applicant portal, you'll be able to go into that portal. There's a link where you can order transcripts. If you find that in the link that your school is not listed, then you'll need to contact your school directly and they can send the transcripts to um, the admissions email or they can uh, send it to the school um, physically. You'll need three recommendation letters. We're not asking for particular people, but uh, people that can speak directly to um, your work ethic and your character. So make sure that you have three of those. Within the applicant portal, you'll have a space that where you'll be able to put their name and their email, click submit, and it'll send them an electronic request. And so they'll just complete it. Once they complete it, it'll send a notification back to the system, letting us know that the, um, that the recommendation letter has been completed. Um, you will have to complete a, re a reflection paper, five to eight pages, which talks about a brief biography, um, basically letting us know who you are, uh, a statement of your theology of ministry, and an assessment of your practice of ministry. I do want to ask for Dr. Christy Woodbury Moore to come back on because I do want her to speak to the reflection paper because sometimes people have questions and they're not necessarily sure of what's expected for the statement of your, uh, your, of your theology of ministry or an assessment of your practice. Uh, Dr. Christie, can you give us more detail in regards to what you're looking for on that part? Okay, so um, the reflection paper really is, um, uh, there are some programs that require a writing sample, and this is a part of that writing sample process as well. It allows us to think about how you write, but also how you think and what you are thinking about in terms of um, the work that you're called to do. So a brief biography, we, we're clear on what that is. Um, when we think about a statement of your theology of ministry, basically we're trying, we're asking you what, how do you understand the importance of ministry in the work that you're called to do in the world? Is How do you understand that? Um, what do you understand about God, self, and neighbor for the most part as it relates to ministry? Um, your assessment of your practice of ministry is hopefully students who enter the program are already practicing ministry. Why? Because you you have your project is tied to a particular context. If you're not practicing ministry in a context, it's going to be very difficult for you to do this project because you will have to find a context. So what I'm saying in terms of the practice of ministry, I didn't say it had to be a church. I said you're practicing ministry. And for some of you, you're practicing ministry as a nurse at your job. That's ministry for you. For some of you, you're practicing ministry with the Boys and Girls Club. For, and then there are those of you who are actually practicing ministry within a faith-based church, brick and mortar church. And that's fine too. So the question here that you wanna answer is what are you doing in ministry? Um, how would you assess your practice of ministry? Meaning, what are you passionate about? What do you have experience in? Um, why do you need a D-man to do, do the work that you're doing in ministry? For some, um, you're, you're answering these questions because the D-man allows you to uh, do more with your Christian education ministry. Um, for others, it's helping you to help, helping you to hone in on what does it mean to be a social justice advocate. So here we're really trying to understand um, what you're already doing in ministry and how this degree can help you along the way, um, at, along with you know, the work that you're already doing in the community. Hopefully that helps a little bit. That's great. Actually, it helps a whole lot. Thank you so much for that. I also want you all to pay attention to the credit hours. You'll have 32 credit hours for our program. It's $650 per credit hour. The 105 activity fee is per semester. Um, so for one semester, you can look to um, uh, your tuition costs will be about $3,255, $3,255. That's really economical. Um, we do offer federal student loans. Um, also on our webpage, 
We do have external scholarships for doctoral students to be able to look through our list and see what uh, doctorate, uh, doctor, doctorate scholarships are available. Um, also, we do have a payment plan with uh, the business office for students who would prefer to pay out of pocket. We also have students who diversify how they pay. They do federal student loans and they also uh, uh, self-pay. So you have an option there. Also for the immersion trip, we just want to give you a generalized number. Um, it'll be between $2,000 to $4,000, depending on the um, immersion trip. Um, we've had cohorts that went to Oxford, England. We've had cohorts that winded up going to um, uh, the um, uh, uh, Kentucky. They've gone to farms. I think there's another immersion trip with Land, Food, and Faith where they're going to um, Dallas, Texas with Dr. Wyvett um, uh, Blair. Um, this coming summer. And so uh, the immersion trips where you are going will determine the costs. Um, for the next cohort, uh, even though the, uh, so the fall semester starts June 1st, you have a one-week residency that will happen July 8th through the 12th. So what we need to look at is that the doctoral academic year is not a regular academic year. The fall semester starts June 1st. And so that's the first day of your semester. And so you'll get your syllabus on the first semester. And then in your syllabus, you'll have assignments and readings that need to take place by certain dates. And also the readings that need to take place by the time you are ready to attend your residency, but you're only in person for one week. That's really awesome because other times you don't have to be in Memphis. You don't have to live in Memphis in order to participate in our doctoral program. Uh, for the spring semester, um, our spring semester starts December 1st, but our residency is going to be January 13th through the 17th. Um, and so that that's important. So of course, Dr. Christie uh, shared about the residencies. You'll have a total of six residencies. That's just one course per semester. That's uh, five credit hours. You will be considered full-time. Your sixth residency will, uh, will be seven credit hours. And so that's the only uh, residency that has seven credit hours. All the rest have five. Um, here's kind of an overview of what your costs would look like. Um, as I shared before, we have a really economical uh, doctor of ministry program, a very affordable cost. And, um, and so uh, definitely don't want cost to be an issue. Although uh, the deadline normally is April 30th, Dr. Christy Woodbury Moore has been so gracious to extend that deadline to May uh, 27th um, of this year. Um, the other thing I want you to look at in regards to the Doctor of Ministry page is all the information that's provided on this page. So what you can uh, look at are the various uh, tracks that are listed. Um, every time you hit the learn more on each of these tracks, another program guide will come up. Uh, also, we have uh, our uh, other webinars that are listed on here, and you'll also see the webinars that we've done for the month of April also added to the website. And so uh, you have other uh, conversations, some with students, some with uh, other professors that have our past professors that have been a part of the program. And so this is very informative. Uh, these uh, pictures, our line of pictures that you all are looking at, are pictures of both current and former students. Some of them you may know. And so uh, we just want people to get a look at the people that have gone through the program or they're currently in the program and, um, and all the work that, uh, that they're doing. Another uh, bit of information I want you all to see will be the cohort dates. For, so for the next three years, 24, 25, and 26, let me make this a bit bigger you're able to see uh, the first day of the semester, which is always gonna be June 1st for the fall, always gonna be December 1st for the spring, but the residency dates won't be the same. And so we've placed on the website, the residency dates for the next three years. So fall and spring. So that's important because you'll need to go ahead and start uh, uh, putting in for a uh, time off. Um, also, um, we have the demon tuition table you can click on that and you'll see uh, what's expected for, for your cost of tuition for each semester. And then also, if you want to, if you're ready to get started on your demon application, you can go ahead and click here and that demon application will take you to the uh, student portal, external scholarships list, 
for you to be able to look through that list so that you'll see exactly um, what uh, um, scholarships are available for the doctoral program. Of course, the cost of attendance um, for those who are looking to use their um, employment, um, tuition reimbursement, sometimes you need that for, um, for your companies or for your churches. And then also the demon timeline, which kind of gives you a, a, a what to expect for each semester. And so I don't see that there are, yes, the low residency of being on campus for one week each semester. Ideal. Awesome. <laughs> I'm reading uh, uh, what people are saying in the in the comments. But um, uh, that's the overview of the admissions process. It's really simple. Um, if you uh, are looking to um, complete your application, um, you can go online to be able to do that. If you have any questions, you can definitely call admissions at 901-334-5891. Um, we will uh, uh, return your phone call or you can go online and schedule a Zoom meeting with us. We'll be more than happy to meet with you either in person or online. Dr. Christy Woodbury Moore, do you have any last thoughts that you would like to share? I wrote this down. We come with the medicine. MTS can help you use it to heal the community. Oh, I love that. I absolutely love that. These have been very, um, I think, very instrumental conversations because you have been able to answer questions that people have been thinking in their hearts but haven't said out loud. And so thank you so much for always being available and always being a resource to um, not only uh, the students in the doctoral program, but just to the community at large. And thank so you. that is our night for tonight. That is our last webinar, but not, our la not your last time seeing us. And so um, definitely get in contact with us on, uh, um, on campus. We would love for you to stop by. We would love to talk to you about uh, our doctoral programs or give us a call or schedule a Zoom no matter where you are. And so to everybody that is on, on Facebook, thank you for joining us. And I hope that you have a wonderful night. Don't forget to share this video or tag someone that you think will benefit from listening to this webinar. Have a good night, everybody.